by the way, I thought that the title of this uh, program was Defining Moments in Brilliance. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, as now my line has been stepped on two times, but I can't control that either. I do find it impossible, in view of the rise of general anti-rationalism in America during the fast, past few decades, as well as this escalating economic crisis and panic of the past two weeks, to think about anything but defining moments in stupidity. So I'm here to return us to the world of pessimism for a little while. Uh, but there's a lot to be learned about brilliance and creativity from taking a hard look at their opposites. And I would argue, as I did in my book, that we need only look around us to see what happens in a society that prefers magical thinking to critical thinking and sets a lower and lower bar for what every citizen, not to mention everyone who aspires to leadership, ought to know. When we talk about a defining moment in brilliance, we're not really talking about a moment, but about a convergence of forces, usually a long time in the making, that encourages both individual creativity and collective innovation. A great many factors must come into play to produce, to cite just one example, uh, the, an explosion of brilliance such as the art of Renaissance Florence and the geniuses we remember from that explosion, from Brunelleschi and Masaccio to Leonardo and Michelangelo, are both the actors and the acted upon in that process. The same thing could be said of the unlikely Enlightenment-inspired founding of our own nation, a phenomenon that rested not only or even primarily on military deeds, but to an extraordinary degree on ideas expressed in words, not the contemptuous phrase, just words, that we've heard from the Republican right in recent weeks, but to an extraordinary degree on the words in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Paine's crisis papers, and the Constitution itself. The most important founders, Jefferson, Washington, Adams, Madison, and Franklin, to name just a few, probably represented the most outstanding collection of minds present at the creation of any government. And they were the products of a long process in Western history, in which the best minds turned away from faith in kings and gods and toward human reason as the instrument for the creation of a more decent and just society. What defining eras of brilliance have in common in modern history is this turning away from blind faith and a turning toward what can be apprehended through the natural human brain and the senses. In other words, toward evidence. I don't, while I agree that there are many things we can't control, I certainly don't agree that, that the only reality is our reaction to it. Now the opposite can be said of defining moments in stupidity. Stupidity insists on the primacy of ideology or faith over evidence. Stupidity never asks, is this working, but insists, this has got to be working because I believe it works. In the age of American unreason, I argue that as a nation, we're enmeshed in a crisis of memory and knowledge that affects everything about the way we learn and think, and that we have become a dumber culture in many ways over the past 40 years, in spite of the fact that the digital revolution indeed does, does offer us unprecedented tools for us to acquire broader knowledge and even experience. Now, the collapse of our economic bubble began with a long-term contempt for logic and evidence that reached from the highest levels of government to Main Street, contrary to Alaska Governor Sarah Palin's attention, uh, contention that Joe Sixpack is the source of all wisdom, Main Street is just about as dumb as Wall Street and as the genius Wall Street lenders who invested in a pyramid of death, of debt, <laughs> death, interesting Freudian slip. What's really happened here is nothing more than a giant Ponzi scheme in which the economy looked good on paper for as long as more people kept investing their money without assessing the worth of what they were investing in. And now that the kissing has had to stop, as it always does, all you need to do is look at the confused faces of government officials in both parties to know that many of them don't have the slightest idea of what they're talking about. Do you think that the average Joe, whether or not he chugs down six packs, who signed on for a subprime variable rate mortgage, understood what the effect of his or her monthly payments on her, his or her monthly payments of, say, a five-point rise in the interest rate would be? As Dr. Schmidt mentioned this morning, 
an international assessment of 15-year-olds in 29 of the world's most developed countries found that our high school sophomores finished fifth from the bottom on a test of mathematical literacy. And interestingly, this assessment was designed in part to assess the application of mathematical principles to real life problems, uh, such as figuring out what interest rates mean when you borrow money. You can be sure that a good many Americans who took on mortgages that they couldn't afford are the products of an education that literally didn't teach them that two plus two equals four, or how you figure out interest by multiplying the, applying the principal by the rate of the interest. So ignorance, not greed, is at the root of, not just greed, is at the root of this economic disaster, as it has been of so many other disasters in history. I repeat, as a nation, we're in serious intellectual trouble. Like defining moments of brilliance, defining moments of stupidity, do not occur in isolation. In 1837, in a speech known as the American Scholar Oration, which became famous around our young nation almost as soon as it was delivered at Harvard, Ralph Waldo Emerson observed that, quote, the mind of this country taught to feed on and aim on, low, aim at low objects, eats upon itself, unquote. Now, Emerson was issuing a challenge to a young nation still engaged in building up its intellectual capital. But his words resonate much more strongly today in a society that has been engaged in dissipating its intellectual capital. I believe that three major intertwined forces have brought us to this impasse. The first is the triumph of the video over the print culture and the ever-increasing public addiction to infotainment. The second is a naive faith in new technology as a godlike source of knowledge rather than as the wonderful tool it is. Uh, and the third is a deeply flawed system of education that partakes of the first two errors and seems unable to impart either the information or the larger, more important capacity of an educated mind to think logically. Now, but of these factors, the first, which influences all of the other, is our addiction to infotainment. Now, it is difficult to talk about this without being seen as a chicken little running around yelling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. But what if the sky really is falling? Now, of course, aggrieved eulogies for print, print culture have become so common that almost no one, except people like me who still make a living from the printed word, pays any attention to critiques that could easily be titled the decline and fall of everything. Those who take a dark view of the intellectual and political consequences of the eclipse of print are obliged to establish their bona fides by showing that they love computers as much as anyone else. So I want to tell you, there's a votive candle burning at home in front of my laptop. And the other thing you have to say is agree, you have to agree with the dubious proposition that computers are making us smarter. No, they're not. And Americans don't like to hear this because we have bought into computer worship as unthinkingly and thoroughly as medieval man believed in the divine right of kings. To say that computers are making us smarter is the equivalent of someone saying during the Renaissance, when forks were invented, that forks were making us better eaters. No, they weren't. Forks enabled people to eat more quickly and without spilling as much food on their clothes or their greasy bare chests, whichever place they lived in, as they had in the past. Just as computers enable us to search for information more quickly and effectively. But the computer, for all its wonder, does not mean that people know what information to look for or how it fits into a larger framework of knowledge. If computers were really making us smarter, computers trading on financial markets, which provide panicky investors with the ability to act instantly on their impulses and emotions, wouldn't have helped fuel the collapse of stock prices around the world. Garbage in, garbage out. In the New York Times last week, there was a front page article headlined Using Video Games as Bait to Hook Readers, which to me suggested that the sky truly is falling. The article quoted one P.J. Harsma, an author producing a science fiction novel aimed at preteens by linking it with a video game. He was very smart because he required that kids consult his book 
for certain bits of information so that they could play the video game effectively. You can't just make a book anymore, Harsim has said. And the choice of the word make rather than write is really indicative of the mindset of someone who, it will not surprise you to know, is a former advertising consultant. Using a video game to get preteens to buy books, he argued, quote, brings the book into their world as opposed to going the other way around, unquote. The whole point of reading fiction, though, I couldn't have said it better myself, is not to pin people down to the world they already inhabit every day. It's to take us into another world in which time and space are suspended and the narrative, not some sort of built-in pop-up reward in a video game, is what draws us on. And by the way, returning to evidence, there isn't the slightest evidence that video games can be used to attract kids to reading. One thing we do know is that the heaviest users of video games, young men from the ages of 18 to 25, are the least likely people to have read books of any kind. In fact, two-thirds of men in this age group never read any book at all, fiction or nonfiction, unless it's required for work or school. Half of Americans under 45, according to a recent survey by the National Endowment for the Arts, did not read any book in the preceding year, which was 2007. Now, I've been told over and over again in emails that people don't read books anymore, that my entire attitude is elitist, the worst thing you can say about anyone today, and that you can find out anything you want to know on the web. Now, that's certainly true if you know enough already from being broadly educated and well-read to know what you're looking for. What does this have to do with our current defining moment of applied stupidity? Well, you can actually learn a lot from books about what happens when lenders make risky loans and the risky loans get bought out by other institutions that don't bother to assess the difference between good and bad debts. It's all there in a wonderful book called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, published in 1841 by an Englishman named Charles Mackay, about what's happened throughout history when people put their money into worthless ventures and it all stays afloat until someone says, hey, that's not worth a cent or a shilling. I highly recommend this book to you if you haven't read it. Try the chapter on the early 18th century, what was called the South Sea Bubble, in which all England went crazy when the House of Lords, in return for a loan of seven million pounds to finance the war against France, granted the South Sea Company a monopoly on trade with South America. The company underwrote the entire English national debt, and shares immediately increased by a thousand percent which was great for the early investors. But this crazed speculation produced other equally unsound schemes. One company was found to manufacture square cannonballs. Now, the problem in all of this was, one, there wasn't enough trade with South America, which trade was largely controlled at the time by the Spanish, and no one saw the slightest need for square cannonballs once the initial shares in the company were issued. When it became apparent that the South Sea Company didn't have enough money to pay off the government or its investors, the bubble burst and people throughout the country lost their life savings. So you really can learn things from books that you can't learn from surfing the web because if you don't know about this book, the chances are you aren't going to find it. Or if you've heard the title, you're going to find a very inaccurate description of it on Wikipedia. Uh, Right, right. It's right there. Just don't read the Wikipedia definition. Uh, Bernard Baruch, in 1957, wrote in his autobiography that his decision to pull money out of the stock market before the crash of 1929 was heavily, heavily influenced by the lessons he learned from reading McKay's book. Now, it's really too bad that some of the people running WAMU and Lehman Brothers, not to mention our political leaders, never bothered to read that book. But of course, reading is an elitist pastime. Now, predictively, the infotainment culture has spawned an electronic cottage industry of scholars and writers poo-pooing old-fashioned intellectuals, AKA curmudgeons, for their reservations about sucking at the video tit from the cradle to the grave. Only in today's America could a book titled Everything Bad is Good for You, how today's popular culture is actually making us smarter, have received glowing reviews. 
The author, Steve Johnson, writes the emerging technology cover for Discover Magazine and acknowledges that he spends a lot of his time playing video games. Johnson declares that studies demonstrate the decline of reading and writing skills are deeply flawed because they ignore the huge explosion of reading, not to mention writing, that has happened thanks to the rise of the internet. While Johnson concedes that email exchanges or web-based dissections of television shows like The Biggest Losers are, quote, not the same as literary novels, he notes approvingly that both are equally text-driven. Such self-referential codswallop, and I apologize, I've been looking for a way to work that into his speech for a long time. Such self-referential codswallop is only to be expected from a self-referential video and digital culture. One might as well make the statement that kitty porn and Titian or Lucien Freud nudes are equally image-driven, because they are. Doesn't tell you anything about what kinds of images. Now, religious fundamentalism is another strong anti-rationalist force, which no one has mentioned today, and one that makes Americans especially susceptible to what I call junk thought. I emphasize that I'm talking about fundamentalism, not of the many other forms of religion which accommodate secular knowledge. The United States is the only country in the developed world in which a third of the population believes in a literal interpretation of the Bible. We're the only country in the world, in the developed world, in which evolution is still considered controversial. In a survey conducted in the 1990s, University of Texas researchers found that 25% of all high school biology teachers believe, biology teachers, believe that dinosaurs and humans roamed the earth at the same time. The anti-rationalism that infects American society as a whole infects teachers too. Is it any wonderful wonder that on these international assign, uh, assessments that Dr. Schmidt discussed this morning, American teenagers rank 14th out of 25? Now, this is not to suggest that Americans are unique in their mathematical and, and scientific illiteracy, but, and this is critical, that there is a unique gap be between America's image of itself as the world's leader in science and technology and the reality of a nation in which more students are spending more years in school while falling behind the most developed countries of Europe and Asia. We are not number one. The issue is not just that American students perform poorly in relation to other countries on standardized tests, but that large numbers of adults, including adults who weren't educated yesterday, don't possess the requisite knowledge for intelligent discussion of any public issue. It's often noted that fewer than half of Americans believe in any form of evolution, even that guided by God. And this is often attributed to religious fundamentalism alone. But consider this. According to surveys conducted over the past 20 years for the National Science Foundation, two-thirds of Americans are unable to identify DNA as the key to heredity. Nine out of ten Americans don't understand what radiation is. One-fifth of all Americans still believe that the sun revol revolves around the Earth. Such responses really have nothing to do with religion, but they do point to a stunning failure of education in the broadest sense. One should not have to be an intellectual, or for that matter, a college graduate, to know that DNA is what makes each of us a unique human being. And one should not have to be an intellectual or a college graduate to know something even more important, that the Renaissance preceded the Enlightenment or that the Magna Carta preceded the U.S. Constitution. One of our greatest areas in, uh, in which we're deficient in knowledge is understanding the order in which things come in history. It's crucial to understanding anything. So this brings us back to junk thought, which involves a fusion of all of the irrational and anti-rational forces in American life today. You've all heard about junk science, which is a huge branch of junk thought and has become a fashionable pejorative, but it doesn't always mean what a reasonable person would expect it to mean. To scientists themselves, the phrase is generally synonymous with pseudoscience, all the new systems of thought, like astrology, that attempt to explain the physical or social universe and can be neither disproved nor proved. Although frequently clothed in scientific sounding language, the leaden heart of all junk science and junk thought is their imperviousness to evidentiary challenge. And this is the essence of our present moment of applied stupidity. 
what is to be done. Uh, there are no easy answers, but I will say that becoming conscious of the fact that we're in the midst of an intellectual, not only an economic crisis, must precede everything else. Defining moments of stupidity are opportunities because they make it hard for people not to at least entertain the fact that something is very wrong and that they can't slough off the responsibility just on that demon entity Washington or Wall Street crooks or Joe Sixpack. I think it's very important for all of us to become more aware of how we spend our own time. Uh, we were just discussing this at lunch, some of us about young men playing video games. And I said, not only are the young men who are spending three hours a day playing video games, not reading, uh, there are also many surveys that show that they're not having as much sex as young men who don't spend three hours playing video games. Well, this is no surprise. Uh, you can't do all of these things at once, however great multitaskers we might think we are. And women generally wouldn't like it if a man was playing a video game while they were having sex. So, consciousness of how you spend your times is important. One of the things I recommend in my book is just turning off the TV and the computer for a certain number of hours on the evening and weekends. And I've had working parents of small children, surely the hardest pressed people on the planet, come up and tell me that they had tried to turn off the, these machines for a few hours and that they found that they actually had time that they didn't think they had not only to read more themselves, but to read books to their children. Now, Charles McKay had this to say in 1841. It's so, it's so apt. Men think in herds. It will be seen that they go mad in herds, while they only recover their senses slowly and one by one. Let us hope that we Americans will take advantage of this moment to stop aiming our minds at low objects. Thank you.